Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We will introduce our new guest in a moment. But first, I wanted to give a shout out, as always, to our presenting chess education sponsors, Chessable.com. We're going to talk a lot today about how to study chess. And of course, if you are studying chess, you want to make sure that Chessable is a component of your study regimen. For me, it's particularly when I am studying opening. Some of their new opening courses include my first 1E4 repertoire by friend of the pod, I am Christoph Selecki, whose work is always great. They also have new courses on the classical English, the ready, much more. And you can, of course, see the link to my favorite courses that will be provided in the description. Now, as for this week's guest, she is a professor of self-regulation and higher education at the Department of Educational Development and Research. And she is vice director of the School of Health Professions Education at Maastricht University in the Netherlands, just to provide a bit more context for, for our listeners. So as you guys have heard me discuss as ad nauseum, my book is coming out in November, and I wrote a chapter about deliberate practice and chess for that book and did a lot of independent research for that chapter. And in doing that, I came back across an essay that our guest had written called Helping Chess Players Improve in the 2009 New in Chess book, The Chess Instructor's Manual, which provided for me a really helpful sort of um, Big picture look at the history of chess research um, and where it was at that time. Our guest has predominantly moved on from chess research, but I still find the broader topic quite applicable and quite fascinating in its own right of how best people can learn on their own. So without further ado, let's welcome our guest to the show, Dr. Anique de Bruin. Welcome, Anique. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it, especially because, as we were saying a minute ago, I know that chess is no longer your primary uh, field of interest, but I still think that you obviously you've spent your life studying how to learn more about things, how to study things. And I think that that's something that all of us chess players uh, are interested in. So, Anique, before we get to your current research, I am curious um, what your relationship was with chess leading up to this essay that you wrote uh, for the 2009 book, The Chess Instructor's Manual? Yeah, so, so that was that came out as a result of the research I did for my dissertation, which I defended in 2006. And in my dissertation, I investigated how um, we can help um, novices learn um, in, in expert ways, so to say. Does it help to look at experts um, to foster learning in novices? And I particularly looked at uh, the uh, context of chess, chess playing. And apart from this topic, the other topic in my dissertation was about how do we know um, how uh, chess experts develop. So what, what makes an elite chess player? And particularly, what is the role of deliberate practice in uh, developing chess expertise? Excellent. And sorry, go ahead. Yeah, this is sort of how it all came came together. And then the two, 2009 chapter was a nice invitation to sort of wrap up everything that I, I did for the dissertation and move it towards the, the chess domain too. The... Yes, and I, and I really enjoyed that essay. And we should say for listeners, it's a little bit hard to find uh, the book currently, um, but we'll be discussing a lot of the research. Now, uh, before we go further, Anique, one thing we should probably do is something that I found surprisingly challenging when I started to do it for my book is to define the term deliberate practice. Uh, how do you define that term? Um, so deliberate practice is uh, any type of practice that is um, intent on improving learning um, um, it's uh, conscious, it's um, effective, it's effortful, um, and it has it has a clear goal. So it's particularly defined either by the learner, him or herself, or by a coach, a trainer, a mentor. Uh, it has a certain um, um, pl plan to it of when it is uh, done, uh, how it is done, and how it's evaluated whether this goal is indeed achieved. So there's there's this is a rather broad definition. I would say there's several or but I tend to go by this one. OK. And of course, it was coined by uh, K. Anders Ericsson and his colleagues in this this famous uh, paper in the 1990s. And chess is actually mentioned in that paper. Um, Anik, how did you come to. So you started to research chess for your dissertation. What brought you to chess? So so it was um, my promoter who had a great interest in deliberate practice because the article, the main article came out in 1993. 
And then I started my PhD about five years later when this article really had generated a lot of interest and people really started thinking about its implications and started gathering more data around it. So my promoter on one hand had a strong interest in delivered practice, and then my co-promoter had a strong interest in chess. So initially we set out to do deliberate practice research and really test the assumptions that Ericsson um, came up with uh, to test these in the field of medicine. But I was not too fond of that field because it's really hard to determine a level of expertise in medicine. It's not just the number of years of experience. It's not just the diplomas that a person has. What makes a good doctor is extremely hard to define. And I think we've come a long way since then, but at that time, around the year 2000, I felt like it would make it really hard for my dissertation to draw any conclusions about relations between deliberate practice and performance in medicine. So then my co-promoter came up and he was an avid chess player. And he said, I think chess is a perfect field. Uh, chess is also, of course, in cognitive science, it's, it's called uh, the, the fruit fly of cognitive yeah. science. Oh, that's fascinating. It, I love it. Yeah, because it has everything in there. You You can... There's a clear performance standards. Um, chess players, even at a young age, get chess ratings. Um, we can look into how they practice and how they train, the number of hours they do, to what extent it's deliberate or not. And we can relate it to their actual chess ratings and how those develop over time. So that turned out to be a fantastic context to study these questions in. Uh, I did highlight the fact that it's so measurable in my book, but if I had known about the fruit fly analogy, I definitely would have used that. I love it. Um, so how hard was it, Anique, as you started to dig in, coming in as an outsider? We know that chess does have a rich history in the Netherlands, but how hard was it for you to wrap your head around sort of the, the chess world enough to write yeah. about it in so much detail? So I guess I approached it the way I would have approached it too, as had I, for example, studied medicine or um, some, I don't know, let's say some athletic sports, I realized early on, I'm not going to be an, an expert chess player. I don't need to be to study it. What I, how, what, the way I'm going to approach this is that I'm going to um, talk to a lot of people about this who know much more than I do and, and get to know them really well. And then in collaboration, design these research uh, studies. So I connected to the Dutch Chess Federation um, or we found each other, so to say. They, I think they saw a presentation of mine quite early on. And then we jointly developed some of our research studies. And that helped me greatly to get to know the field and to get to know some of the, the participants too early on to, to be able to develop these studies in such a way that the data would be rich. Excellent. Yeah. And one of the studies that I found really interesting and I think um, important, for, we have a lot of uh, chess teachers and even, I mean, almost everyone who listens to this podcast is going to end up teaching some chess, whether it's their job or not. Um, I found the study that you shared about the importance of uh, self-talk or self-explanation to be quite interesting. Could you walk our listeners through that study? Yeah. So self-explanation is a, is a, let's say, a learning strategy, a generative learning strategy where students are asked while they are studying to actually at certain moments voice out loud just whatever they are thinking about and also to explain it literally to themselves. So this can be done, for example, when you read a text and you stop after each paragraph and you ask yourself questions like, what did I just read? Did I understand it? How does it connect to what I already know? What am I expecting to read next? And what do I not understand? Those kinds of questions. So it's it's not merely thinking aloud, which is another technique, but it's actually trying to explain it to yourself. Now, this we took from, let's say, these more um, problem-solving domains like physics and text learning domains to the chess environment. And we ask ourselves the questions, if we have uh, our participants study a certain chess technique, in this case, it was an end game, a, a simple end game because it was for novices. If we have them explain to themselves out loud uh, what they think the next best move will be, then we would hypothesize that this will lead to better structuring of their thinking, but also better recognition of when they do not actually know what to do and uh, what they could be doing to better understand it. So it, it has actually sort of a cognitive and a metacognitive effect is self-explanation, while it's also not actually quite burning on the participants. And that was our hypothesis. And that turned out to be true in the sense that the ones who self-explained 
while playing chess and trying to predict the next move out loud and explaining why this was the best move, were in fact the ones who were performing better in the in the end on the uh, end test that we took. Yeah, fascinating stuff. And correct me if I'm wrong, the the reason that you chose novices is that you can actually sort of isolate the variables. Whereas if you take some people in the middle and try to teach them something, like some may already know it, some may not, but by starting from scratch, you were able to measure precisely what you wanted to. Yeah, we call this, we're equating the prior knowledge, equating for prior knowledge. And of course, in most educational contexts, students tend to have very low prior knowledge. Uh, or they have some, but it varies to quite to, to a big extent. So it's that's why you often see research on novices in, in educational sciences. Yeah. And you conducted some other experiments as well, correct? Or oversaw them? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Yeah. And we looked into how we could foster their metacognitive abilities, so the extent to which they were able to reflect on their actual learning and the extent to which they were aware of their actual level of learning. Uh, which is quite hard to do. We know that students tend to overestimate how much they have learned. So how do we get them to better calibrate their um, their judgments about their learning? So that's what we also tried out in chess in novice chess players. And it was interesting that we found that indeed, under certain circumstances, we could mend this, what we term metacognitive illusions, so students not being well aware of their own learning. But interestingly, it was much harder to get them to actually restudy than what they needed to restudy some of these chess uh, moves. So they 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 were aware that so they let's say their reflective abilities were improving, but their regulatory abilities, so their actual restudying behavior and adapting their learning to what needs to be done, that was much harder to improve. Hmm. And and you mentioned you did an interview that touched on your chess research with the K Prime podcast, and and that one you mentioned that you felt that this sort of ability to self reflect was a differentiator for between elite players and non elite players. Yeah, yeah, this is also what Ericsson uh, clearly describes, and what I also found in in the research is that um, what what experts are particularly good at is reflecting on their own learning. They're very self-aware. They they know really well where they stand. This, of course, also has to do with the fact that they have typically rich feedback environments. Uh, chess, of course, also sort of allows itself to, to get rich feedback. You can try to predict the next move, and then you see to what extent that was a good move or not. Or you can replay games uh, played by others and then find out whether you would do the same, etc. So this rich feedback helps to develop your reflective abilities. But just generally, it's something that experts excel at. And... They're very determining not only in how I'm learning now, but also in how I'm um, selecting learning opportunities for the future. So so this really fascinated me. Like, how can we foster these reflective and metacognitive abilities in, in learners in general? Yeah, it's it's a fascinating topic. And there have been a lot of success. There have been a lot of chess players who have ended up crossing over into poker at various times. I, I was a former professional poker player myself. And people sometimes ask me, like, what's the similarity? And it actually is the metacognitive reflection that I find to be most similar because someone with a chess background is used to the fact that they make mistakes and they need they need that's part and parcel of the game and they need to be able to um, to evaluate that and and move forward. But do you have a sense of whether this is something that maybe these elite players are born with? Or do you think it's something that they develop uh, because they become elite chess players? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's the big nature nurture discussion. And I think the response is the boring uh, nature nurture interaction. Um, not knowing exactly to what extent nature versus nurture plays a role here and what factors um, uh, within nature or within the environment actually determine the development of, of these abilities. I mean, I think there's there's personality factors involved. I think there's uh, affective factors involved as well because it's it's also, it has to do with having a strong sense of knowing your weaknesses as well. So you have to have a very realistic perspective of yourself too. And it's tempting to have a bit, a bit of an optimistic sense of self. And then at the same time, it's good to also have that optimistic sense of self because otherwise you wouldn't try out a lot of stuff and you would might, might be too disappointed by, by failure and rejection. 
but it's it's a very complicated relation and and i think we're yeah we're only scratching the surface when it comes to understanding exactly how it develops i do i do very strongly feel that these abilities can be developed so it's not something that without any type of practice they self develop it's 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 just like the same with any type of expertise development it's a matter of putting in many hours and making sure that there's a strong possibility for for feedback and improvement based on the feedback okay and in when i was rereading the anderson paper while i was uh writing my own book um i hadn't visited that um paper since i'd read outliers and around when it came out which we'll, we'll probably get to eventually but I was surprised to discover that he mentioned the idea of deliberate practice needing to be inherently enjoyable because um, deliberate practice has sort of become part of like the the broader sort of discourse about how to get better at something. And at least in the context of this podcast, when people bring it up, I don't think they're necessarily um, thinking that one has to be suffering. They're just thinking of like, I'm practicing and I'm trying to get better at something. Um, how, how do you parse that, Anique? Do you think that, that, did you agree with that assessment that it needs to be something that you're not enjoying in order for it to qualify as deliberate I, practice? I don't see, yeah, I don't see why it should be a necessary condition. I think it's it's sort of an epiphenomenon. It's a consequence of what they are doing because they're doing something that is supposed to really increase their learning so it's something at the edges of their ability. It's in right. the zone of proximal development. So it's never what we in, in reasoning research call a system one type of task. It's a system two type of task where nothing is automated. It doesn't feel fluent. It feels effortful. It, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's a logical consequence of that. And therefore, it's, it's not playful. Right. And we call playful activities, we call those enjoyable. Um, there's there's quite some debate in in the field um, in the broader psychological field as well about if something is effortful, is it then enjoyable or not? Or can we see it as valuable, or is it just something that's so, um, well, how do you call it, uh, not nice to do that it cannot be enjoyable? Well, if you know that the result is going to be enjoyable because you're going to improve, then you might also find it inherently more enjoyable. I think it's much more complicated than than how Erickson proposed it initially. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I appreciate the distinction between effortful. Like I, I can I, I can I can get on board with it needing to be effortful with that without that automatically meaning that it needs to be unenjoyable. Um, and I mentioned the Outliers book, which I believe came out in 2008. And it sounds like you were already well into your research by that point. And obviously, that book became a phenomenon in its own right, um, you know, sold a ton of books, but some people felt that it was oversimplified. Um, what was it like to sort of live through the explosion of Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers book, suddenly shining this massive spotlight on this topic that you'd already been researching? Yeah, yeah, that was that was so interesting. I think what I mostly, I, of course, I completely approach this from the the scientific academic uh, context. That was the way I approached it, and it was so amazing to see, like, wow, this is this is the way to really get this message of you know, uh, working hard pays off. Uh, don't give up. Don't be don't be um, taken aback by failure or by non progress. It was fantastic to see how Malcolm Gladwell was able to put that in writing. And of course, I had this, well, I, I couldn't have written it, but I was like, wow, it's amazing if you're able to do that. Because I had quite some discussion around, around the dissertation finishing when I finished my dissertation and I defended it. I had some quite some um, interest from, from the media, but it was always about does, does talent exist or not? And the message, of course, is much more complicated. And I think that Malcolm Gladwell was able to verbalize or write it up uh, in a fantastic way. And did it make getting funding easier? <laughs> well, by then I had moved on to the field, more broader field of metacognition. So then I, I didn't acquire, try to acquire funding on it. And maybe it would have, maybe it would Yeah, have, um, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. curious. It really shifted thinking for a lot of people in this area. Yeah, it's, it's unbelievable how uh, how popular that that book came. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Anik, uh, but you also did some research involving uh, gender in chess, correct? 
Well, it was one of the variables we took into account. So, so one of the studies in my dissertation done in collaboration with the Dutch Chess Federation, um, they had a quite practical question. They said, we see lots of uh, good chess players drop out. And we want to know why they drop out. And we would like to be able to predict it so we can prevent it. We also have the sense that uh, girls drop out more than boys. And we want to understand it. So so I investigated to what extent um, these chess players, uh, these were young elite Dutch chess players, to what extent they were practicing chess, how they were doing it, to what extent it was the deliberate practice or not, and how that was related to their chess ratings, but also how that had developed over time. So I asked them to complete a diary for a couple of weeks. I asked them about what they had been doing the years before. And then we did complicated regression analysis to find out to what extent uh, variables such as deliberate practice actually contributed to their uh, chess development. And we looked at, we analyzed the data separately for those who dropped out versus those who persisted. Now, interestingly, what we found was that the ones who dropped out were not the ones with the lower chess ratings. Well, they were in the end, but not from the start at all. Um, it was the case that the dropouts actually had been practicing less for years before then. So it wasn't as reflected as much in their chess ratings, but it was reflected when you looked at the, the amount of hours they were spending on it. What we also looked into was to what extent do they benefit from chess practice? So if you look at if, if a dropout spends one hour of chess playing, to what extent does their chess rating improve? I mean, this is what you, of course, can statistically compute. And how does that compare to somebody who persists? Do they benefit to the same extent from one hour of deliberate practice? And the answer was clear and it was yes. So it's the amount of hours. It's not the quality that they do. It's not that they learn faster. It's not that they learn better. It was really uh, to, in our analysis, the amount of hours they were spending on it. And we could even see that years before that, you could already start predicting who was going to drop out and who wasn't. And gender did not seem to play any role or did not moderate any of these uh, relations whatsoever. Okay. Um, but overall, in I mean, that's fascinating, first of all. And thank, thank you for, for sharing it. Um, and it confirms some some suspicions I had formulated on my own about just the, the uh, I mean, it's somewhat um, intuitive that the more time you put in, the, the better it is. Um, for your chess. And sort of beyond the scope of your study, just looking at um, the gender gap within chess, particularly the participation uh, gender gap, there has been research or the data shows that uh, girls, especially early teens, um, tend to drop off at an accelerated rate uh, from, from the chess world. Now, there's lots of potential reasons um, for that that I could uh, speculate about or not. But first of all, does either your research or you from a personal perspective have any theories about uh, why that might be? Yeah, for my own research, the only thing I can can say to you that is we did not find any differences. We only found this general pattern of less practice leads to higher chances of dropout across the two, to two genders that we then measured. So so from my own research, I can I do know that when I was doing the research, this participation rate hypothesis uh, an article on, on it in Psychological Science came out um, where they analyzed to what extent uh, the participation of uh, females in chess being much lower actually explained a large uh, part of the variance uh, in the difference in performance between males and females. Um, I haven't kept up with the literature since then, so I don't know what it's like. It was very convincing back then, very compelling. Uh, it's it's of course a very logical explanation. We need the data to back it up, but it is true that there's so many more boys participating even at a young age than girls. You can see it. I did some research on also on kids starting to play chess, and then it was like a factor one to ten or two to ten even at that age. Yeah, and I remember interviewing the students. That was also very and it's extremely dominant when I interviewed or I, I did a survey actually I did not interview them a survey on. Um, these elite chess players, how did you learn to play chess? And then nine out of 10, if not, well, nine out of 10 said I learned it from my dad. And then one of, out of 10 said I learned it from my grandpa. Wow. Huh. Yeah. yeah. The the legacy is so um, 
strong that uh, there's there's been to my mind decent progress in the area of um promoting chess to women and making sure it's um welcoming for people of all all backgrounds and and all genders but the legacy is a lot to overcome and uh this in the past year there's been a lot of uh, unfortunate sort of um uh, sexual assault allegations there was one particular story involving grandmaster alejandro ramirez which the repercussions are still reverberating, but stuff like that, it seems like it, it would be really hard to to measure in a study the the effect of if, if women just don't feel safe playing in a chess tournament. Um, that's that, you know, and that's something that it's coming to, you know, it's coming to light now in terms of modern news. But obviously, there's probably an untold legacy dating back for decades. In academia, there's a similar um, discussion going on and more stories coming out when it comes to the the sciences, the the physical, right. the natural, the natural sciences, uh, and what it is like to 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 be working and studying in in such a often masculine environment for females. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Of course, it doesn't happen. Surely, it doesn't happen anywhere. But there's some quite some strong, awful stories coming out these days. Yeah, sad but true. But in the past, maybe they didn't come out at all. So it's, you know, yeah. it's hard to say that it's a good thing, but probably necessary, at least, um, for progress in the future. So before we get to your modern, your current research, Anik, we have a few questions from supporters of the podcast related to chess. Um, and thank you. This has been fantastic. I'm really enjoying this interview. Um, so Tyron Ross Price um wonders if there's any books you recommend to get a good understanding of the science of learning in general. Yeah, I thought about that. You asked me beforehand and I came up with three different books. I'll start with the final one. There's a new book. It's an ebook. You can download it really easily. It's it's uh it's free. It's called In Their Own Words. What scholars and teachers want you to know about why and how to apply the science of learning in your academic setting. Well I guess you can apply this to chess too. Um, I, the, I, myself and a colleague, we wrote a chapter in there about our learning strategy program, Study Smart. But this is this is sort of a collection of the, the most recent insights when it comes to the signs of learning um, in all kinds of domains um, and in a more fundamental way, but also in a very applied sense and anything in between. Um, so I definitely recommend that one. And related to those is one, it's more related to um, uh, Teaching, why don't students like school? A cognitive scientist answers questions about how the mind works and what it means for the classroom by Daniel T. Willingham. I should read that one for my son. He's uh, ten, he's 10 and he's he's reaching the age where he's made up his mind about school, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah then I think this will be interesting for sure. And then Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning by Peter Brown and colleagues. Okay, that's the one uh, friend of my friend of the podcast who's a chess master and a cognitive scientist, Dr. Christopher Shabri, recommended that one. So I actually read that oh, yeah. one in my research. So I'm uh, I'm one for three, but I, I and I'm sure listeners will be excited that one of your recommendations is free. So yeah. <laughs> I, I will be sure to link to uh, to all three of those. Um, and uh, so Nate Sola, another uh, friend and listener and sometime guest of the podcast, wondered if the learning research had any surprising findings relating to chess. And he also wondered tangentially, what is the biggest thing that chess coaches get wrong? Yeah, so so the first one, I'm I'm not up to date with the recent literature on chess, so I'm afraid I can't answer that. When it comes to what is the biggest thing chess coaches get wrong? Well, I, I, I wouldn't know. I, I'm not sure what they would get wrong, if anything. But I could give some tips, some tips for what they should start doing if they aren't yet. Um, and then my response would be, would be to first and foremost get to know your coaches very uh, very well, get to know them very well at a cognitive level, at the metacognitive level, and at the social emotional level. Because for them to learn, so let's start with the cognitive level. For them to learn, the practice you are providing should uh, be maximally challenging shouldn't be too easy, it shouldn't be too difficult. But how to get to that precise level for your coachee, of course, is the big question then. And I get, I assume in chess, a lot of tech is used, right? So there's there's yes. uh, a lot of online playing, there's feedback about what they're doing well, or what they should be improving on. So that is extremely helpful for a coach to, to connect to in order to get this student in this zone of proximal development in this... Um, uh, to work on this, to, to actually design deliberate practice environments. 
Now, the same holds for the metacognitive level. So, so get to know to what extent your coachee is reflective. How much are they aware of their own level and their skills um, and help them develop these reflective skills? It's not easy to do so because it's sort of playing playing chess at two different boards, I was going to say. Um, you're typically working on the cognitive level um, if you're interacting with a coachee. You're helping them improve their chess ability, but then to do this, to improve these reflective skills, the same uh, happens actually. You, you're using this chess context to help them reflect, like, how are you doing? Um, I think one easy way is to just have them predict how will, how they will do on a certain a next move or even a game or even some other exercise and then reflect and see whether they were right, to what extent they were right, why they were wrong and how they could get this mismatch um, um, to disappear. So that's then you're trying to improve their monitoring ability. And the same you could do for their regulatory ability. So the way they, the, the, the extent to which they're able to decide what they should do next, what they should work on, what goals to set and whether those goals are feasible and how to reach those goals. It's, it's a modeling and directly explaining why uh, you're doing these exercises, these, these metacognitive exercises with them is extremely important. It's not just a matter of asking them, so how well do you, do you think you did? It's really, yeah, making this a metacognitive exercise. That... So have them tell the story of, of why they lost a game, for example. Yeah, and, and explain also that you're, as a coach, deliberately working on their reflective abilities because that will help them improve themselves. Okay, yeah. yeah. And then finally, at the social-emotional level, um, they won't learn if they if they don't feel well, and they quit. Mm -hmm. They'll quit sooner if they're not sufficiently resilient to to deal with failure um, and setbacks. So it's really important to create an open and respectful atmosphere and show that you're interested, but also model that it's okay to have negative emotions like doubt and insecurity. Modeling really helps there as well. Okay. This is very helpful. Thanks. Um, and we have one more listener question, which is, uh, have you seen any research to support the suggestion uh, that chess players do better academically? And that one is from David Lazarus. Yeah, that's a good question. I looked into that, but that has been quite a while ago. Then the the connection was, there was no strong evidence. Mm -hmm. And I think um, it all has to do with the fact that um, there's very little transfer of knowledge and skills typically. So what we learn in one domain only transfers to another domain if the relation is very clear and strong. Um, if not, we tend to overestimate how easily things transfer. So if I if I learn to play chess, then I will also be better at something that remotely looks like chess. Um, um, and, and unfortunately, that's typically not the case. So... I guess that's what impeding also, I mean, it may also be just difficult to to research this in the right way. Uh, maybe there is an effect, but it's hard to discern. For sure, it's not really large. Um, it might be the, a delayed effect, so that's even harder, right, uh, to, to discern. It's harder to prove if something only happens years later. Um, but yeah, transfer issues are abound uh, in, uh, in educational domains. Uh, life would be so much easier if, if transfer from one context to another would be higher. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of, I mean, of course there, there have been studies, you know, you know, that say that, you know, they increase chess increases math scores or something. I don't know how robust these studies are to what you're saying, but I think a lot of chess teachers and chess educators who are looking to either grow their program or, you know, get outreach to, to newer schools. I think that they sometimes might sort of rush to to quote that stuff when when my personal perspective is that uh i mean all extracurriculars are beneficial for students and chess certainly falls in that category and it has a lot of self-evident benefits for kids who take a liking to it so in my personal opinion there's no need to over promise yeah yeah that's right i agree with that absolutely um so anik it's been great to hear and i really appreciate that you've sort of um uh, revisited all of your chess research for us. And it is fascinating and quite informative with l lots of takeaways for my own thinking and I think for our listeners as well. Um, but what what's animating you currently? What is your most recent research and um, and any tentative conclusions from this research? Yeah, so so let's say over the last five, 
five years, my research has been focused on how do we get students to self-regulate towards desirable difficulties. So I'm still extremely fascinated by self-regulation of learning. So this is any context where students get to monitor and control their own learning. They decide what they want to do. They decide how they want to do it. And of course, this applies to, to a large part of education and more and more um, imagine in, in COVID times, but even now still, um, students have more flexibility in their learning in terms of what, where they learn and how they learn, but also what they learn. So these self-regulatory skills are really important. But then the, the topic of desirable difficulties started interesting me because desirable difficulties, it's, it's actually indeed quite close to deliberate practice. And deliberate practice is about the type of actual exercise a person does and how that relates to expertise development. It's an expertise development concept. Desirable difficulties is all about the learning conditions that foster long-term learning and skill development. So, so what is it that, how do we design education instruction in such a way that students, in fact, do not learn it just for now and for the exam tomorrow, but are able to use this information in the future and hopefully also are able to use it in a different context? So this transfer question pops up again. How do we increase transfer? And this, uh, this uh, term was coined by Björk and Björk um, already some time ago, more than a decade ago, the desirable difficulties uh, con concept. And ever since, there's been quite some research on what desirable difficulties are. Um, there's a very nice review paper by John Nalaski and colleagues in 2013, and they reviewed hundreds of studies that were on what actually promotes long-term learning. And these learning strategies they mentioned were typically coined desirable difficulties. So, so one example is that we know that if you learn uh, vocabulary or you learn from a text, and you're generally inclined to just uh, go over these words or text multiple times, rereading, restudying them. Uh, but it's actually much more beneficial for your long-term learning if you start taking practice tests. So actually retrieving the information from memory very early on, much more, much earlier than you would actually like because it's too effortful and because you don't feel like you're learning. You feel like you're learning when you're rereading, but in fact, you're not. So so these verbal difficulties are really interesting from a self-regulatory self perspective because this is something that is quite counterintuitive. I would prefer rereading but I should actually be testing myself. And this is something a lot of students struggle with, and it's actually directly impeding their academic development. So how do we get students to self-regulate towards using more desirable difficulties? That's that's the main question in my research. That's fascinating. And obviously there's some chess implications. So I'd just uh, interject for, for listeners. Um, Nate Solon has written about the idea that if you're like studying and opening, um, one thing you might want to do is even before you study it, you might try to write down what you think the moves are or put in a lead chess study if you're doing it digitally. Um, but it sounds like that is something in addition to sort of reviewing where you're prompted with sort of the sequence leading up to where you guess the move as this website that sponsors Perpetual Chess, Chessable does. Um, so that that's useful, but it also sounds like it would be useful to try to regenerate everything you know periodically, even yep. though you're going to get a lot wrong. Yeah, yeah. It's. Um, I think what you're describing is, is, is a perfect example of what I think, and, and I think many more people think are the most important ingredients of a desirable difficulty, uh, the fact that there's active retrieval or active processing um, coming from memory or within your cognitive system, instead of passively absorbing information or just reading or just processing whatever it's out there. Um, we might have the feeling that we're doing something really active when we're rereading a text, but in fact, it's not doing what, it's, what we're supposed to be able to do in the end, which is just applying the knowledge and uh, retrieving it from memory or or predicting this or actually making the next best chess move. And then the other aspect, uh, uh, apart from the activeness, is the feedback aspect. So to what extent does this learning situation, this learning condition, actually provide you with direct feedback, di as direct and as immediate as possible, about your uh, level of learning, about, you know, in this case, um, the, the prediction of the next move that, that is coming up. Um, if you can create such a an active retrieval plus a feedback situation, then that seems to be a very strong desirable difficulty. Okay, that's interesting. So in the 2013 um, sort of overview paper that you described, uh, are there any other sort of top line conclusions about uh, desirable difficulty that that we might be interested to hear? 
Yeah, apart from the retrieval practice, the other what 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 is termed in other uh, following papers as well is the is a gold winner in terms of learning techniques is distributing uh, learning uh, over time. So it's not just um, dividing the learning task or dividing the exercise you have to do, but also ensuring repetition. So going over the same materials. Uh, over and over again. We tend to think that if we are able to recall something from memory or we're able to solve a problem once, that we, in fact, will be able to continue to do so in the future. But for something to really become stored in memory, ingrained in memory, a lot more needs to be done. And uh, repetition of learning is is important then. Um, there needs to, We know that spacing between the learning sessions then really helps distributing the learning sessions. It's hard to tell what the exact ideal distribution is, of course, that's, that depends on the domain and depends on the complexity of the task and your level of learning, etc. But um, uh, spreading it out is better than massing practice, for sure. Okay. That's, yeah, that's also good to know. And actually, I'm relatively heartened to hear that, you know, I talk, I interview lots of top trainers and players, and we talk about chess improvement, but we all sort of feel, at least I do, like we're kind of just guessing, you know, for the most part about uh, best learning practices. And and I suspect, uh, Anik, that even in your field, you still feel like you, you have a lot to learn, but it is nice to hear that it does sound like within this fruit fly uh, endeavor that that a lot of chess trainers have hit on a lot of uh, these precepts in terms of like as you mentioned uh, space repetition and the importance of uh, active learning. Um, do, yeah, do you have anything- I even looked into whether there is any literature connecting the desirable difficulty framework to chess, but I couldn't find any literature on it. So yeah, for the future. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. We often find ourselves lamenting here on the podcast that there's there's not as much research as we would like, which feeds into my my next question, which is I, you you talked in your interview on the K-Prime podcast about the challenges of funding for your research, which I know is a constant challenge for many um, academics. Um, if you were given a fully funded chess study, first of all, I know if you were given a fully funded study of anything, maybe it wouldn't be strictly related to chess. But if it were related to chess, is there anything in particular that you would like to see uh, researched or tested? Yeah, you know what? I, what I really would like to see research, and I, I don't think it has been done, or or maybe not in the way that I envision it. I I'm really interested in this also this early phase of getting to know a field and how then a sense of and a self efficacy and persistence develops. So I I have this hypothesis which I would very much like to test, and which is probably wrong, like like most most hypotheses are, but that's what science is about. That. When it comes to um, becoming an elite chess player, for example, that there's a lot to um, early success experiences. And these need not be objective success experience, like really winning a chess tournament, but they can also be subjective, like, I know, a grandpa or a father uh, saying to you that you're that you're so good at playing chess or rewarding you with attention for playing chess, etc. But then the interesting question is, how many of these success experiences do you need to have at what intervals? And I think it's also crucial to have some failure experiences early on, because in the end, what what developing into an uh, into an expert also means is knowing how to deal with rejection, failure, setbacks. And it's, I think, some sort of optimal combination of success experiences, early success experiences, but also early failure experiences. And that could be something you could easily even try out in experimental settings and then give some people uh, an X number of uh, success experiences versus somebody else who gets less versus more, somebody who gets early failure experiences as well, and see how between groups, this then develops into the extent to which they are willing and um, actually investing time in chess playing. And again, the fruit fly um, analogy applies here because that would, I think, chess playing would be a very relevant context to study that. I, I think it would apply, it would have implications for general education, but this is not something you would want to test in general education because of ethical concerns. Right. Wow, that that's fascinating. I, w- I would love to see that. So if anyone listening, I don't know if you'd be able to do it yourself, and I know you're a busy well, I'll, woman. I'll... <laughs> yeah, I, I if anyone has funding, I'll I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right, we we've got a deal, and of course, um, I will link to uh, Anique's uh, bio, which has her contact uh, information. Well, Anique, this has been fantastic. Um, so if we were to sort of, so I feel like you've already given great advice. Um, 
for teachers who are looking to do a better job in terms of uh, imparting um, the, the proper characteristics for a long runway for chess improvement for students. But we have a lot of adults who might have, say, five to seven hours a week or maybe even more uh, to work on chess on their own to, to sort of sum up our conversation, given the current state of, of um, knowledge about desirable difficulty. Uh, do you have a sense of like, for example, people argue about or aren't sure about how much to compete as compared to how much to study, how much to play as compared to how much to uh, solve difficult positions. Do you have any parting advice about like what our best guess currently is about how to spend that time? Hmm, that's, a, that's a really tough one. Um... I guess what I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of the Anders Anderson, and I think he would he would advise to to really look into what are the let's say the most crucial weaknesses at any point in time, like where is the where is the biggest improvement possible in terms of of course what it means to be able to improve like winning a certain chess tournament or getting a higher rating, et cetera. Try to identify what it is that is actually impeding you the most and where the most improvement is is around the corner and focus on that. And then of course you can do that in a desirably difficult manner. You can then start thinking about how do I create these conditions that actually make, sh make sure that I do this in an active manner and that I receive feedback on it. Um, and that I look at the extent to which this is actually improving my longer term learning and is helping me um, perform in in other contexts, yeah, uh, outside of my training uh, environment. That's fantastic advice. Yeah, I, I sometimes char characterize it as like the reason for your result. Take a take a look at all of your games, and if you were forced to sort of obviously more than one factor contributes to the outcome of any chess game to yeah. any loss. But if you were to try to distill what's the single contributing factor to the games you win as opposed to the games you lose, you can often sort of drill down to something that might be uh, unpl an unpleasant truth or something that's yeah. not your favorite aspect of and, the game. But And ask, please ask for feedback from others. We know that peer assessment tends to be much more accurate than self-assessment. Ah, that's a good point. Yeah. And these days in chess, there's algorithms that can even help. There's like, uh, they of look course. at different phases of the game and tell you yeah. uh, which phase is either holding you back or propelling yeah. you forward. <laughs> Um, well, Anik, this has been absolutely fantastic, really fascinating. And I, again, I know you're, you're super busy. So um, anything to say uh, before before we say goodbye? And thank you again for, for sharing all of your knowledge. Uh, no, just thank you for inviting me. Uh, this was uh, really enjoyable. So it might not have been deliberate practice or desirably difficult, but I very much enjoyed it. And I hope you continue uh, doing so too with this fantastic podcast. Oh, yeah. thanks. Probably some space probably. repetition for you since you hadn't <laughs> since you hadn't been researching chess recently, and you yeah, got a, yeah, got a chance to bring it all forward. It was active retrieval, for sure. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Anik. Really appreciate it. Thank you.